Uh, if you have a Bible, you're going to turn to Ecclesiastes. Um, it's in the Old Testament. It's uh, in between Genesis and uh, Revelation. Uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. If you go to the middle of your Bible, you usually open up to Psalms and just keep going a little bit to the right and you'll get to Ecclesiastes. It'll be chapter 4, a couple of verses there in chapter or four, five, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Again, congratulations to our, uh, our high school graduates, the class of 2019. That's pretty uh, awesome. I was the class of 1991, so you flip the 19 and you change the 20 to a 19. Uh, that was a long time. So the math, I was trying to do the math on that. I never was good at math. That was about 28 years ago. So that means that somebody in here is really, really old uh, or starting to get old. I think that's me. Now, I'm not Brother Chad old, but I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> But anyway, congratulations to our graduates and their parents. So we're, we're continuing. We have this week and next week left in our Stormproof series. And then we're actually going to kick off uh, on June 2nd. I think that's a Sunday. June 2nd, Brother Chad is going to kick off our summer series. And we're doing Summer in the Psalms. And so we're going to be going through different, different psalms. Obviously not all of them, uh, but per- looking at particular psalms and kind of spending our summer there. And Chad will kick that off in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we're uh, finishing up our Stormproof this week and then next week. And what we said in this series from the very beginning is that in life, we're going to go through storms. Um, the, the storms could be family-related. They could be health-related, financially related, emotionally related, spiritually related. Just all kinds of stuff that we go through life. But we're going to experience difficult seasons in our lives. And Jesus said so. We've said this verse over and over. John sixteen thirty three. In this world, you will have what? Trouble trouble. But the good news about the storms is that God wants to help us to weather these storms. He wants to equip us, to strengthen us, and to walk with us through life's tough stuff. And the storm that we're going to talk about is the storm that we don't always talk, we don't really get a lot of attention to, but it's a storm that I think a lot of us deal with, including me, and that's the storm of comparison. Um, one of the definitions in Webster's Dictionary for compa- to compare is to view in relation to. So I'm looking at something, and I'm, I'm looking at in relation to something else. Uh, for example, he's tall compared to me, or she's, she's beautiful compared to me, or compared to him, you know, I look like Barney Fife, or she, she's a way better mom compared to me, or compared to them, my child looks like they've never played a sport in their life. Or I don't stand a chance compared to her. Our house is garbage compared to theirs. Or here's another way we say it. I wish I I had their money. Life would be easier if I had their money. Or their their marriage is way better than mine. Look Look at their posts on social media. It must be nice to have the perfect life. Why can't, why can't, why can't I be more like him or her or Maybe we say this to our kids or to our spouses. Why can't you be more like him or her? My life would just be so much easier if I had what they have. You get the idea. And and when you start hearing those things and start saying those things, you can kind of start to hear the storm building. And believe it or not, comparison can become a storm in someone's life because comparison leads us to feeling inferior, inadequate, incompetent, and, and just deficient. And when you're not happy with who you are, then you're not happy. But comparing is, it, it's a trap. And it's a trap, it's a trap that will destroy your outlook on life. It will destroy your self-esteem. And it will drive a, a wedge in between your relationship with you and God. Because after you kind of get angry with yourself, like, why can't I be like that? Then quickly your anger will turn towards God and say, God, why did you make me like this. Comparing yourself to others, it's, it's a no-win proposition, and it's, to be honest, it's foolish. And so that's going to take us to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 6. And it says this, I saw that all labor and all skillful work is due to one person's jealousy of another. This too is futile and a pursuit of the wind. The fool folds his arms and consumes his own flesh. Better one handful with rest than two handfuls with effort and a pursuit of the wind. 
Now, Solomon, who wrote this, Solomon was the wisest person to ever live uh, on this planet. And I want you to notice something here when we're looking at those passages. He's not saying that hard work that leads to success. He's not putting that into question. That's not, he's not saying that's, that's bad. Hard work that leads to success, that's a good thing. But what he's addressing is the envy that happens in someone when they see the success of others. And did you notice what he said about it? He said that jealousy was futile and it was a pursuit of the wind. In other words, it's, it's pointless. Nothing will come of it. It's silly. And, and the, the example that Solomon gives is, is hilarious, chasing the wind. I, I don't know if you've ever tried that. I, I, I challenge you today to, to go outside after church and go to a park and just try to catch the wind. <laughs> um, and, and tell me how it goes. Matter of fact, just if you would video yourself and send it to me, I, I would appreciate that. But it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And that's what, that's what Solomon's tell, telling us here. He says, comparing yourself to someone else is silly, it's pointless, it's foolish. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't work hard. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to better yourself, to try to improve yourself. But there's a difference between driven to be better and then driven by comparison. One, one is you're trying to be the better you, and the other one is, is you're trying to be someone else. And I remember reading a, a blog on a parenting, uh, about parenting a few years back, and I, I love what it said. It, it, it really spoke to me. It said that as parents, we need to parent the child that we have, not the one that we wish we had. And, and I bet there's a lot of parents in our world and maybe, maybe even in this room, who are trying to parent the child they wish they had instead of loving and parenting the one that they have. And you know why that happens? It happens because we start comparing. We start comparing our kids to other kids. And it's not just parents who are guilty of this. We're all guilty of comparing. We compare our jobs, our incomes, our families, our marriages, our homes, our dating life, our spiritual life. We compare our churches, our health, our looks, our clothes, our cars, our cell phones, our social media posts. We all do it, and it's not healthy. And here's the other thing. It's not godly. And there's some real dangers that can happen uh, when you start comparing yourself to others. And, and these are in your outline if you, if you want to take notes. Of, and, and one of the things, when you compare yourself to others is you're looking at a life that you were never meant to live. When you compare yourself to others, you're looking at a life that you were never meant to live. I'm me. There's no one else like me. And a lot of you are going, amen to that. There's no one else like me. There's only me. And I'm meant to live the life that God made for me. God created me. God created you. There's only one you. There's no one else like you. And your personality, uh, the way that you're made up, your, 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 your talents, your giftedness, those are, those are yours. Those were given to you by, by God. The, God's plan for your life, it's just yours. You're not, meant to my, you're not meant to live my life, and I'm not meant to live your lives. And your life isn't better than mine, and mine's not better than yours. God never meant for us to kind of stand face to face looking at each other and go, you know, pointing out, okay, well, you're better at me than this. Well, I'm better at you than this. Or your life is, is easier or blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Your life is your life, and it was given to you by God. Now, there are things in our lives that we do that we have to suffer with because of choices that we have made, consequences of, of decisions that we, that we have done. And sure, we, we can learn from one another, and we can encourage one another, we can help one another, uh, we, but we're not supposed to be the same, and we're not supposed to compare ourselves to each other. We're supposed to be who God created us to be. Because the reality of this is, when you compare, you will always lose. When you compare, you will always lose. There's always going to be someone who's a little better than you at something. Someone who has a little more ability than you at something. Someone who has a nicer whatever than you do. Someone who has, has more money than you. Uh, whose kids are a little bit smarter, maybe a little bit more uh, capable in some area. Someone whose house is, is bigger than yours. Someone who's promoted ahead of you. No one, is, no one is perfect and no one has the perfect life. But man, boy, do we sure, stu we sure feel like it when we start comparing ourselves. When we start to believe that I can't be satisfied with my life. I need what they have. 
You know how it goes. You have in your homes, you probably, I don't know, some of you do, but in your homes you have this, you have a great TV in your house. It is, it, you're totally happy with it. It's perfect. It's just the right size for the room. It's sitting in the right spot uh, so, so it doesn't get the, the reflection. You've got the sound working on it perfect. And, and, and everything is great. But you walk into a Best Buy and you see another TV that's bigger than yours, that's clearer than yours, that's sharper than yours, can do more things than you can, and then all of a sudden the TV that you thought was the perfect TV no longer is good enough for you anymore. And you have to have something else. And you know what? That doesn't happen with just stuff. It happens with our lives too. We're happy with who we are until we turn on the TV or we walk into the gym or we walk into church or we're sitting in the carpool line or we walk into, into work or, or when we start to look on, on, on Instagram and then all of a sudden we, we allow what we're seeing to make us feel less than satisfied with who we are we compare and we lose and instead of seeing God's blessings in our lives we start seeing all our deficiencies but some of you may may be arguing with me in your head right now and, and, and you might be saying well my life is miserable Jimmy my life is not good like theirs I don't have what they have I all their life is so much better than mine and what I would say to you as you're arguing with me what I would say to you is work on making you better Don't work on being them. Work on making you better. Ask God to help you be the you that he wants you to be. I've used this in a lot of contexts, but draw a circle around yourself and work on everyone in that circle. And another thing that happens when you compare yourself to others is you're not looking at God. You're not looking at the creator. What happens every time we take our focus off of God and put it on ourselves or on others? I'll tell you what happens. Nothing good. Nothing good, nothing that lasts. That's what happens. Your life gets, it gets off center. And the reason why it gets off center is because what you're looking at, what you're comparing yourself to is not, is not true. It's not, what I mean by that is it's not level. It's, it's not the standard. Um, it, it's like building a fence, uh, a, a, a wooden fence, and, and you're just kind of eyeballing the pickets as you put them up there. You ever tried to do that? When you don't level each picket, after a while, as you start to build a fence, you start noticing that your pickets are kind of going like this. And you, get, and you know why? Because you're not, you're not leveling it. You're not putting it up against something that's true, and you're just kind of eyeballing it, and it doesn't work. And you have to make sure that you're not just eyeballing your life, but you're measuring it against the true standard. And you might be saying, well, Jimmy, we don't measure up to God. And I would say, you're right. There is no comparison. But we need to measure our lives based on how God defines purpose, how he defines meaning, how he defines value, how he defines success, how he defines a life that is well lived, how he defines a, a fulfilling life, how he defines priorities. Because that's, that's our level. That's our true north. If all we're doing is looking side to side at the people around us and we're eyeballing our life based upon what we see, then we're not looking at God and we're, we're making it super easy for ourselves to fall into this comparison trap. So if comparison is not good and we get caught in that trap, what do we do? How do we, how do, we do that? How, how do we break free from comparison? Well, the first thing I think we need to do is we need to find identity in Christ's purpose for us. We need to find identity in Christ's purpose. You're not worried about living like everyone else when you're busy living for God. You're just not. If I'm living my life to please God, then I don't have to necessarily worry about what you think, and I don't have to really worry about trying to measure up to you. No offense here, but we've all got problems. Now, we may not, we may not talk about them a lot, or we may try to hide them, but we've all got problems. So it seems a little foolish to me to try to, to, try to be like someone who's imperfect. You don't need to try to be like anyone. We've, we've all got the imperfection down. We're all good in that category. So instead of trying to live for what people think, let's think about what God wants us to live for. Did you catch that? So instead of trying to live for what people think, let's think about what God wants us to live for. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his, his workmanship, created for good works, which God, him, created, he prepared for those, 
prepared those in advance. We should walk in those. There's nothing about comparison. There's nothing about, you, you know, you were, you were, you're kind of like one of God's workmanships, and, and God, your works are a little bit, you know, yours aren't as good as what he prepared. It's not that. There's no comparison there. There's nothing about their living for man. There's nothing there about check, what else, well, check out what everyone else is doing. It says you are God's workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus. You were created for good works, and those works were created for you. And you should always walk in those. Now, I, I don't want you to walk out of here and, and get the big head and thinking, wow, this world is all about me. I love this. Jimmy said it's about me, me. He kept pointing me, you, you. He kept saying, that's not what I'm saying. Just look back up in your notes. I said, it's, it's not about you. It's, it's about God. Our eyes, our focus, our attention, our lives should be towards God. And he's how we measure our success. He's how we determine our priorities. He's what, that's him, that foundation, that's what we build our life on. You see, you know what happens when you try to put your own identity in something other than Christ? Well, then our identities are never settled because they're always changing. It's always changing. Think about our class of 2019, okay? And imagine what it must have been like, and you could probably remember for you too, what it must have been like for them to try to build their lives, or if they tried to build their lives, on what their friends said on what their friends thought. In elementary school, there were things that they were really into, things that were really cool, things that were fun, but then those things changed. And what was cool in first grade ain't so cool in sixth grade anymore. And oh man, but then you get to middle school and, and things are changing daily in middle school. Uh, one day this is popular and cool, but the next day this is popular and cool and you're trying to be a part of the in crowd, but that in crowd is kind of always changing. And, and then you get into high school, and all of a sudden, what was great in eighth grade seems really silly now in, as, as a freshman and a sophomore. And then you get to be a junior, and then a senior, and all the rules kind of have, they've changed again. And you can see why so many students are so miserable and get lost during their teenage years because they're trying to fit in, trying to please everyone, and they're so afraid to be an outcast or to be alone. They want to be a part of a community. And it gets tiring trying to fit in. Instead of being maybe content with who they are, they look around and say to themselves, I've got to be like him or her. I've got to be like that. Otherwise, I'm going to be a nobody. And nobody wants to be a nobody. And let me tell you something. It's not just teenagers who struggle with this. There are adults who are in it way worse than our students. Their identities are in their jobs, in their spouses, in their kids, in their stuff, in, 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 their, in their Facebook account, in their bank account. They look around and think, I've got to keep up or I'm going to be a nobody. And nobody wants to be a nobody. But when we put our eyes on Christ, guess what? All we have to do is live for an audience of one. He's the only one we have to live for because we are his. So we find our identity in Christ's purpose. We've also, we've got to find contentment in Christ's love. Find contentment in Christ's love. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, listen to this, while we were still sinners, he what? Christ died for us. He died for us. You know why I love that verse? It's we don't have to perform for God's love. Everywhere else in our world, we're performing. We're, we're, we've got to perform for, for the job. We've got to perform for our teachers, for our coaches. We've got to perform to, to make sure that we, we keep up. We're, we're constantly trying, looking for the approval. But we don't have to earn God's love. We don't have to wonder if we're good enough for God's love. Romans 5 eight clearly states that his love for us had absolutely nothing to do with us and our current condition, and it had everything to do about him and his unconditional love for us and his desire to repair the broken relationship between him and us that we broke. And there's freedom in that verse. There's hope in that verse. And there's contentment in that verse because God loves me. During life storms, you really do get perspective. 
and you don't focus so much on, on what, what Joe's doing or, or what Jane's got going on. You're not so worried if you have the right stuff or if your house is big enough. You're not so focused on, on what's going on everywhere else in the world and how everyone else's life is going. Because see what we do, we have this bad habit of overcomplicating things. And I'm not saying that stuff is wrong because I have stuff and I'm not saying social media is wrong. I've, I've got it too. I'm not saying money's wrong. I mean, money's, money's a good thing. But the problem with it is it's never going to be enough and you'll never be content if that's where you're looking to find contentment. We find contentment in God's love. His free gift of love. We don't have to worry about him changing the rules. We don't have to worry about him not liking us. We don't have to perform. We just have to simply accept his love for us. And then we have the awesome blessing and opportunity of loving him right back with our lives. Your life may not look like so and so or, you know, over there. Or your life may not look like your neighbor's life or your co-worker's life. Or your in-law's life or your brother's life or your sister's life. But you know what? doesn't matter to God. God's love for you is the exact same as his love for them. God's got a plan for you, and God loves you, period. You know, we also need to find peace in Christ's presence. Find peace in Christ's presence. I'm not sure if, if this is a really a manly thing to say, but I really like Disney movies. Um, and, and the animated ones. I know they've, they've got a lot of other stuff out too, but I really love, and one of my favorites, and if I didn't lose my man card just then, I'm going to lose it right here. But one of my favorites, honestly, is The Little Mermaid. Uh, that came out when I was, I think, in middle school, high school, um, and, and I, I absolutely loved it. And the best part of it, and usually the best part of most Disney animation, are, are the, the songs, the music. Um, I, I don't know how Disney does it, but they, they always have great songs in their, in their animated movies. Some of the songs from that movie were, you know, Under the Sea. Remember that one? Uh, Kiss the Girl. You know, remember that one? Uh, <laughs> you got scared. Le Poisseau. You remember that song? Le Poisseau. It was the chef was cooking up the fish and uh, uh, the, the lobster clam, whatever he was, he was in there watching him. He was getting sick because he was watching him cook all the fish. Uh, Poor Unfortunate Souls. Remember that one? And of course, probably my favorite one was Part of Your World. I hate to say this, but I think I know all the words to that song. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Let's all stop right there. <laughs> Didn't you think my collection's complete? Looking around, sure you think. Sure. She's got everything. I've got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I've got who's it's and what's it's galore. You want thingamabobs? I've got 20. But who cares? No big deal. I want more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I need to go watch football or something really quick to kind of make me manly. Um, but uh, the, the, whole, the whole theme of that song, though, it's a great song, but it's a sad song because despite everything that she has, she's still not happy. She wants more, and that's kind of the, actually the theme of the whole movie. Um, all her family and, and her friends are trying to convince her what a great life you have here under the sea, but all that she can see, all that she's focused on, is the world that she wants. The life, get this, the life that she doesn't have. Now, does that sound familiar to you? We may not be mermaids trying to to live out in the real, in the human world, but there's so many people who despite the goodness and blessings that they have in their lives, all they can see is what they don't have. And instead of peace, they find themselves always wanting something different. Hebrews 13, five says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you that's peace in God's presence you don't find peace in possessions you you find peace in knowing that God will never leave you that he will always be with you that he will walk through all the storms with you he will never abandon you that's why you can look at your life and you can say I'm okay I'm my life is a work in progress God is with me and I know that whatever I face today he already knows He's already prepared, and he will love me, and he will lead me through it. I'm okay. 
And we need to find life in Christ's victory. We need to find life in Christ's victory. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this, We don't focus on the things that can be seen, but on the things that can't be seen. The things that can be seen don't last, but the things that can't be seen are eternal. You know why com- the comparing, you know why that's a trap? Because it gets you focused on a bunch of things that aren't going to matter for eternity. You can have all the money in the world, and guess what? That won't matter one bit to God. You can be the most popular person on the planet. And you know what? That won't matter one bit to God. You can have all the coolest, latest, uh, bestest stuff, and guess what? That's not going to matter to God. You can be named People Magazine's uh, most beautiful person for the next hundred years in a row, and it won't matter a bit to God. You know what's going to matter to God? What's going to matter to God is what you did with the life that he gave to you. That's what's going to matter to God. Did you give your life to Christ and live your life for him? Or did you give to the, your life to this world and try to live for it? Money doesn't get you into heaven. Good looks don't get you into heaven. Stuff doesn't get you into heaven. Popularity doesn't get you into heaven. How many likes you have on whatever post you have, that doesn't get you into heaven. The only thing that gets you to God is Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he was raised to life three days later, conquering sin death in the grave Jesus and only Jesus gives us victory that's what we should be living for back in Ecclesiastes 4 uh, verse 6 it says better one handful with rest than two handfuls with effort and pursuit of the wind meaning all that we do in our lives should be done to meet God's goals for our lives and not to meet the standards set by all the people that we compare ourselves to. Real living is found in giving and in serving. Giving our lives to Christ and serving those around us. When you're busy loving God and busy loving others, you don't have time to compare. You're not, you're not chasing after the wind. But when you're living for God, you're chasing after him and his, his, his purpose for your life. We need to stop looking out here and comparing, but we need to start looking up and saying, God, who do you want me to be? Because he alone can satisfy you.